Hi folks and welcome to workshop 5, module 2. In this module we'll be talking about crime control and crime prevention as an industry. Now first we're going to look at the US context and mainly through the example of prisons. The assigned reading for this module uh, is an investigation in how the prison industrial complex presents itself to itself. And it does this by analyzing the American Correctional Association uh, Corrections Today magazine, which is the industry magazine. And it presents itself as a newsletter for the correctional building industry. And in this magazine, we find three main forms of content talking about the building of parts of prisons or entire prisons, um, content around the equipment for running a prison, and content about how to run a prison. And it contains paid advertisements as well as articles, um, some of which are written by employees of the firms advertising products in this magazine. So... Already we can see that there is a very much a commercial uh, focus um, um, in the uh, industry. Now one uh, excerpt uh, that is identified in the reading is quite useful to pay attention to. Um, and I'll read it out here. The July issue also contains two other extraordinary items. One consists of several pages of thanks to the sponsors of the banquet to be held at the annual Congress of Correction in Minneapolis. From telephone companies to manufacturers of bulletproof glass, they pay and the prison officers celebrate. An additional attractive feature of the Congress is that you can leave the town in a beautiful, sporty, brand spanking new 1991 Dodge Daytona ES, fully equipped with every imaginable accessory. The only condition is that you visit the exhibit hall where the industry shows its products and get proof that you've been there. And when you are registered in the hall, you are automatically a participant in the lottery for the car. So it's quite interesting. I mean, this in itself, having some kind of industry conference or, or show or something like that, isn't the problem per se, but it is uh, problematic for crime prevention in the sense that the commercial imperatives behind uh, you know, the privatization of crime prevention and crime control uh, and the profit motive and the requirement for growth sit uncomfortably with the vision for crime prevention as reducing crime and finding alternatives to imprisonment. Now, the author of the reading has a few reflections on how the industry represents itself. And one is this almost unbelievable construction of prisoners. Um, the author notes that while medical journals do similar things um, and pharmaceutical, f pharmaceutical firms excel in briberies of doctors through sponsorships, um, we might note that doctors are supposed to be a bit of benefit uh, to patients, whereas the Correctional Association is another kind of organisation altogether. And as the author says, it's the organisation with a mandate to administer the ultimate power of society. It is an organisation for the delivery of pain, here sponsored for eating, drinking and dancing by those who make the tools, that is, the tools to provide the pain. So let's think about private pressures in the crime prevention context. At least in the US, prison operation is big money. There's money to be made in building prisons, providing equipment for running prisons, and there's money to be made in the operation of prisons. And it's interesting to note that in the industry magazine, um, uh, as well as in other um, prestigious publications like the Wall Street Journal, uh, corrections 
are prom uh, presented as a sort of investment, an opportunity. And the author of this week's reading uh, talks about an interesting comment in the Wall Street Journal from 1996, uh, saying that the beauty of the prison management business is that incarceration, incarceration rates are increasing faster than the prison budgets of many states and municipalities. Though the savings are difficult to measure, analysts contend that Wackenhut typically can slash 15% from the $50 it takes government to clothe, feed, and guard an inmate each day. So that's obviously talking about a private firm could slash 15% off the cost that it usually takes a government to uh, basically look after an inmate in prison. And the article goes on to say it's a win-win situation because both taxpayers and prison companies benefit. Um, it's interesting to note that there's no mention about prisoners either and their outcomes. Now, all this being said, um, this isn't really anything radically new. In fact, the history of the modern prison is tied in with the history of private interests. In fact, the origin of prisons is in private operation, in, the Eng in England and the USA in particular. Uh, back in the bad old days, um, prosecution was a private affair. Policing were, police were privately run. Local prisons were private, usually run by alehouse keepers. The transportation of prisoners, so if you sort of know your European and English colonial history, um, especially in Australia and initially the US, uh, prisoners were transported from England to the colonies as punishment. And the transportation of prisoners uh, was the result of uh, private initiative and business interests shipping convicts across the Atlantic from England to the American colonies, for example. Uh, and so it's interesting to be mindful uh, of how the central idea of the way prisons should be designed was initially formulated by people who wanted to profit from the running of prisons. Now, this brings us to the classic example of Jeremy Bentham and the Panopticon, which you've probably come across in other uh, subjects as well. But in short, um, the idea of the Panopticon uh, is that you have a circular wall of cells surrounding a central guard tower, as you can see in the image there. The guards can see into every cell but the prisoners can't necessarily see the guards. So the logic behind this is that you have maximum surveillance at minimum cost. Now Jeremy Bentham designed and developed plans for private contractors to run this panopticon, and he campaigned to obtain a contract for himself. He invested thousands of pounds of his own money in an effort to acquire a site and develop a prototype, but he ultimately lost this investment. But its basic design became influential in terms of uh, the economics of prisons and the architecture of prisons. And just as an aside, you may also want to refer to Michel Foucault's work, uh, which uses the Bentham's panopticon as a metaphor for social power. Now, this brings us over to the political economy of prisons. The first is this idea of prisons or crime itself as an unlimited natural resource. The industry seems to perceive of crime as a resource. The economic uh, interests of the industry are always going to favour oversupply. Now, there's a strong incentive for expansion of the system. And privatisation makes it simple to build and operate prisons. Um, it makes it simpler for governments because they no longer need to ask voters for permission. Uh, they can instead rent from the private industry or borrow money uh, for construction. And private operation also allows governments to manage employee strikes by 
inserting clauses into government contracts, uh, preventing um, prison uh, employees from striking or demanding better conditions. But the other aspect of this is not just as a resource for private uh, interests to, uh, you know, uh, build and grow more prisons, but they also function as units of production in themselves. In fact, prisoners aren't always a strain on the economy. I mean, even though we have historical examples of labor camps and concentration camps and gulags and such, they actually have a modern equivalence in contemporary prisons as well. Uh, one example um, in, uh, from the reading was this idea of a US prison that produces modules for new prisons. Uh, in a broader context, we're talking about how inmates get assigned uh, a job and work a full shift every day, usually unpaid or barely paid. Uh, certain materials required for a prison are often made in-house by prison labour. You also have the sort of classic example of license plates and highway signs being made in prisons. And in, and in addition to the cost of building prisons is the direct income from prison labour. So state and federal authorities uh, often benefit from prison labour by virtue of the fact that inmates are making furniture, road signs, and other materials that can be sold on. So in a sense, state prisoners are already working for private industry. And then we have this um, other element of convict labor, right? So we have prisons as a whole as units of production. We have prisoners and convict labor. And this uh, is, uh, you know, Basically, uh, this sort of quote helps us unpack this. Uh, an American worker who once upon a time made $8 an hour loses his job when the company relocates to Thailand where workers are paid $2 a day. Unemployed and alienated from a society indifferent to his needs, he becomes involved in the drug economy or some other outlawed means of survival. He is arrested, put in prison, and put to work his new salary, $0.22 cents an hour. From worker to unemployed to criminal to convict labourer, the cycle has come full circle, and the only victor is business. Now, we also want to think about not just prisons and the prevention industry in the national context, but also what it means locally. Now, locally, they're actually a source of rural economic growth. Because it's not just what prisons produce, but what they consume. And this consumption can sustain local economies. So prisons are no longer sites of shame in some parts of the US, as there's increasing competition uh, in local councils or local districts to get prisons located there to stimulate the local economy. Prisons are seen as stable providers of labour and incentives for the workforce. And in this sense, we can see how punishment can be a leading rural growth industry. In fact, the prison boom can slow down the exodus from small towns, allowing young people to stay in their own areas where they grew up due to the direct and indirect economic impacts of having a prison there. And now in the US national context, um, we have expanding state expenditure on prisons since 1988, law enforcement and the criminal justice system uh, has experienced an expenditure of growth at twice the rate of other federal spending. Um, public and private expenditure on security and crime control is approaching the cost of US military spending. And the cost of the war against enemies within, meaning um, you know, uh, managing crime within the state, is becoming comparable to the cost of war against enemies without, that is, wars outside of the state in other countries. So this is just something to think about in terms of um, crime control as an industry and what we can sort of take away from the US context, which is uh, that it actually has significant economic impacts, both as a producer and consumer uh, of goods.
Now we come to the Australian context and the regulation of private security. In terms of private security as industry, um, because there's been uh, such a growth in the industry since the uh, 60s and 70s, this has been a key factor behind expanded regulation of the industry in the Australian context. Um, in 2011, um, a survey was conducted across 70 countries, estimating that there were 19.5 million people employed in private security uh, in those countries, and an estimated 25.5 million uh, across all countries in the world. Um, globally, there's been an annual growth rate of about 7 to 8%, and in Australia between uh, 2006 and 2008, it was estimated there were 45,000 police uh, compared to 112,000 licensed security providers, although many of these were part-time. What are some of the reasons for growth? Well, there's a range of factors. Um, one main factor appears to be market demand driven by a uh, crime increase in the 1960s. Although, that being said, this increase in crime is also associated with increased prosperity and personal mobility over the same period, which, in other words, means it's not just that crime rates were going up at this time, but people were better off. There was more stuff to steal. Um, we've also seen the growth of mass private property venues. So, you know, mega shopping centres, sporting stadiums and things like that. We've also experienced improvements in security technology, uh, legislated workplace safety standards, uh, increased litigation by victims of crime, and also the post-September 11 um, terror uh, situation. Now, there's a current downward trend in crime, especially property crime, uh, which is closely associated with the uptake of security and continuous growth in the sector. In other words, there's a downward trend in crime and an upward trend in the growth of the private security sector. Now, in terms of uh, regulatory issues and regulatory responses, um, just some of the things you want to keep in mind are that... Uh, there were certain uh, instances of violence and negligence by security at entertainment venues. Um, a lot of issues around violence, um, as well as some emerging problems around insider crime, uh, general incompetence and poor standards, uh, and uh, issues around breaches of privacy. And uh, some of the sort of broad regulatory responses have been along the lines of um, membership standards uh, with professional associations, uh, regulating through criminal and civil law, uh, through employment, fair trading, privacy and weapons legislation. Um, the sort of default approach has been that governments uh, try to enforce occupational licensing regimes uh, that are comprised of competency cert certification and integrity certification. Uh, internationally, uh, licensing, licensing systems have been established from the 1980s onwards, but there's a lot of variation in terms of what's required and how these are enforced. But in terms of best practice, a lot of European countries present some of the more developed systems. So, in terms of misconduct issues, we see that there's industry-specific legislation emerging that's driven by a diverse set of problems around competence and misconduct issues. And these issues have been brought uh, to prominence through critical media attention. And I've listed a few uh, key points uh, on the slide there under that. The deregulation of liquor licensing in 1987 was identified as a key influence. We're talking about cheap drinks and promotions and all-night hours and things like that. Hotel and nightclub managers were criticised for encouraging um, aggression among crowd controllers and things like that. 
we move over to the mid-90s in New South Wales and there's another inquiry triggered by a range of adverse incidents including allegations of underpayment in the contract security industry. Um, so overall it was still too easy to set up a security business or work as a security provider. Only the most minimal requirements and checks uh, were required and often these were easily bypassed. So we have what's called the first wave of reforms of the industry. And in Australia, the regulation of private security is the responsibility of the states and the territories. Um, the first wave of industry-specific regulation, that is, regulation specific to the private security industry, uh, is the New South Wales Security Protection Industry Act of 1985. And this introduced licensing of security firms and employees. There was a certain set of criteria that I've listed on the slide there and the focus of um, this regulation was on guards, consultants and some classes of security equipment providers. The police service administered this act, they set training standards uh, and had firearms accreditation and so on. Now before New South Wales 1985 it was a similar situation across Australia. There was only very tokenistic legislation for private security, and this tended to be focused on debt collectors, private investigators, and only some forms of security guard. Um, but even at this time, obtaining a license was almost as simple as filling out a form and paying a fee, and you could effectively strap a gun to your hip and go on patrol and things like that. Now, in terms of regulatory responses, the main elements of this new legislation was the introduction of compulsory pre-employment training, uh, as well as disqualifying offences in certain areas, such as theft, fraud, and violence. So, there are some bare minimum standards that are being introduced um, uh, across different states and territory. But otherwise, there's still significant gaps and inconsistencies with regard to bodyguards, security consultants, control room operators, installers and repairers, and even locksmiths and other and trainers of private security. Um, it was only in New South Wales and Western Australia where there was near complete coverage of all different security occupations, um, and legislation um, administration spread across police departments and consumer affairs divisions within justice departments. So, you know, there's some level of improvement with the regulations, but there's still a lot of gaps. Now, thinking in terms of the second wave regulatory responses, now these are piecemeal and complex changes to regulatory frameworks. Some states used existing legislation, other states introduced entirely new acts. Licensing was extended to pretty much all areas of security work, so this includes locksmiths, right, consultants, in-house security personnel, trainers, electronic system installers, and those people who monitor them. Uh, there were an increased range of disqualifying offences, such as firearms and drug offences, so this means that if someone who wanted to train as a security guard had one of these offences in the past, they would not be eligible. Um, and there were other measures in place, mandatory fingerprinting for reliable criminal history checks and that sort of thing. Uh, so this is the stage that we're sort of at now, continually uh, refining and reforming uh, regulation. So just a few reflections overall on what this kind of means in terms of the big picture. We need to bear in mind that the profit motive and the industrial rationalities that are at work when it comes to crime prevention as industry and as a product is at odds with certain framings of crime prevention as well as justice. That said, the profit motives and industrial rationalities fit well within the actuarial logic of neoliberalism.
What this means is that preemptive and exclusionary practices of crime prevention become favoured because they're the most efficient. So we're talking about removing the problem population from society indefinitely rather than any sincere attempt at rehabilitation. Now in practice these things target socially and economically marginalised people. So we have to question whether this is a sanitising approach to crime prevention. Simply cleaning out and removing the unwanted um, materials from society. But this is the material, political, economic reality of contemporary crime prevention as industry. So what can students and practitioners do? Well, they need to be mindful of different ways um, to completely overhaul the logic, although that's a huge challenge. But it's also important to be mindful that there are these tensions and limitations hovering in the background, and it's worth thinking of better procedures and techniques to avoid the worst outcomes. About recognising that in the pursuit of profit uh, and in the absence of appropriate regulations or legislation, we can enact uh, situations with very, very poor quality control when it comes to something as important as security. So when it comes to industry and regulation, it's not just about preventing corruption, right? Although there were several corruption issues identified in the different reviews and such. But more importantly, it's about ensuring adequate accountability and quality for crime prevention and hopefully justice.